Today we're going to look at the big picture. If you want to find your way into Psalms uh, 76 or 73, Psalm 73, uh, the big picture. I'm, uh, my wife is very fond of putting 500-piece uh, puzzles together uh, and, you know, this type of thing. Maybe some of you are fond of this, too. I know Nita Budlong is fond of this, and uh, it is not something that I'm fond of at all. Uh, I, I think it's a very annoying thing to do, but, but uh, Mimi finds it to be good. And I think that one of the, the most important parts about putting a puzzle together such as that is you got to see the picture on the cover. you got to know what you're putting together. I mean, just going at it blind and not knowing how to put it together. And I think it's, I think it's imperative when it comes to, um, it, it, when it comes to, the, to life and to God and the things of God, is that we see the big picture. What is the big picture? What's God's big picture for everything? For life, for you, for... For, you know, what is it all about? What's the big picture? And I'd like to talk to you about that a little bit this morning about the big picture. First of all, the Bible, the Bible is a book about God. The Bible is written and reveals God. It reveals where in the Bible God reveals himself, he reveals his purposes, and he reveals his ways. I think a lot of us start reading the Bible because of the personal interest that we have, our self-interest. We, we've heard that the Bible is good for us. It's the good book, and if we read it, it's going to benefit us a lot. And who can deny that? That's an absolute truth. But as you read the Bible and you start studying the Bible and you get more and more understanding of it, it really isn't a book about you. Surprise, surprise, surprise. It isn't about you. It's really about God. It's a book that tells us all about the God that we love. I mean, that's very important. It's important because when you go to the Bible, having that understanding, it's like seeing the big picture. The big picture is, this is going to help you to better understand God. Everybody has an opinion of God. But the truth about God is revealed in His Scriptures. In the Scriptures, He makes known Himself, He makes known His purposes, and He makes known His ways. All of them are, in, are vital in understanding God and to be able to have a relationship with him. Then the other thing to understand that is very clear as you study the scriptures and you work the scripture is that God is working and uh, his workings are designed to bring about an increasing deeper and more profound love relationship with him. That like Bill shared with us last week, God is continually pursuing a love relationship with you. This is God's big picture. He wants to love you. And He wants you to love Him back. This is the beginning of everything. With Adam and Eve. The whole point of humanity. Why did God make people? It seems to me if He made dogs and cats, things would have been a lot easier. But He made people. Why did He make people? He made people so that they would, He could love them and that they could love him in return. That is the big picture. That's what paradise was all about. Paradise wasn't about an environment that was free for the individuals to pursue the lusts and covetous desires of their hearts. That's not what paradise was about. Paradise wasn't perpetual orgasm. That's not what paradise was about. Paradise was about an unencumbered relationship with God. Where, you could live with it, where they could live in love with God, God could love them, and He could love them back. That's paradise. And that is what is in the end, when the kingdom comes. The whole earth is going to be changed. The animals are going to be nice to each other. There's going to be an abundance of food. There's going to be no more evil, no more devil. Everything's going to change. Everything's going to be... We're going to go back to a paradise-like environment. But none of that will mean anything if we don't have the main thing. And the main thing was, and is, and will be, a love relationship with God. I mean, what good would it do to live forever and not have that? You see, and that really is what paradise is all about. That's what Eden is all about, or what people say heaven is all about. It's really all about understanding that God loves you, 
And God wants to have a continual love relationship with you. That is the most important thing to him. That's why God has tolerated all the nonsense he's had, he has, for these centuries that have gone on. Why he puts up with it, because this is a part of his plan. In the end, the only people that are going to exist eternally are the ones that are head over heels in love with God and that, God, that will receive the love that God has for them. And that's what eternity is going to look like. That's why it says in John 17, 3, Herein is eternal life, that we may know, that we may know, experientially know God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can know that now. We can, we can know paradise now. We can know the kingdom now as we accept God's love for us and we share that love back with Him. That is the big picture. Love is the big picture. How profound. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, I put it up here on the screen uh, to save a little bit of time. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death. A hey, people, there's a choice. You got a choice. Here's the choice. Life, death. Blessing, cursing. Which do you want? Which one do you want? You want life, you want death, you want blessing, you want cursing. That choice that he gave to the Israelites where this is written is the same choice that exists today. We all have that choice. You can choose death or you can choose life. You can choose blessings or you can choose cursings. <laughs> so choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, and how? By loving Yahweh your God, by obeying His voice, and by holding fast to Him. For this is your life. You see that? I have it underlined. I tried to bold it too, so that it would sort of stand out in the verse. Right? You, you got that? So let's read it together. This is your life. What is your life? Loving God and God loving you. I mean, that, this is your life. That used to be a TV show, didn't it? Back in when they had black and white TV. I think it was. This is your life. Oh, God, what a miserable, you know. And the length of your days that you may live in the land which Yahweh swore to your fathers. God pursues a love relationship with you. He takes the initiative to bring you into a relationship with Him. He created you for fellowship with Him. This is the purpose of our life. This is where life's purpose is found in this love relationship. This relationship should be real to you, it should be personal, and it should be ever-growing. If you're not wholeheartedly in that love relationship with God, I suggest you ask for His help and start pursuing it with all your heart, your soul, and your might. The defining quality of, of the biblical heroes, people like David and Moses and Abraham and Paul and all of the Bible people, the great heroes of the Bible, that, are, that, are, that stand out so much. These are not men and women that had a persnickety attitude towards a, a adherence to the, the nuances or, e, or the, the, you know, the, little, the law, the persnickety little things about that. What makes them stand out above all the rest is their love for God. Accepting God's love and sharing that love back with God. That was what made David such the wonderful man that he was. It didn't, it didn't free him from making mistakes or Abraham from making mistakes. That wasn't the point. Or it didn't, it didn't enable them to be perfect in everything that they did. The point is that they were in love with God. God loved them and they knew it and they loved him back. And that's, that's, the, that's the main thing. That's the, that's the big picture. That's what God wants. The defining quality of our life should be this passion for our God. You know, really, if your love relationship with God is not settled, nothing else in your life will work. Nothing else in your life will really fulfill you. I mean, you'll have glimpses maybe of success in life, and you'll feel good from periods of times, but really the, the core thing of what humans are about, I mean, you can, use a, you can use a screwdriver as a hammer, 
but it really was designed to be a screwdriver. Humans were really designed not to screw other people, but I couldn't help doing that, but to, but to love God and to be loved by God. That reminds me, uh, uh, John, I, I'm going to... You know, uh, John, well, I won't do it to you. I, I, uh, <laughs> I was down at, uh, I was talking to some fellows down at the, uh, the city, let's see, the city mission or the Salvation Army. Where was it? One of those places. I was talking to this fella and uh, talking to him about God and about Jesus and so on. And he said to me, look, well, maybe you can help me. Maybe you can pray for me. You can pray for my hearing. I said, sure, I can pray for you, no problem. So I put my arms on his shoulder and I started praying for him. And then I got really inspired and I put my hands on, on his ears and I was praying for his hearing and all the rest. And um, yeah, it was a pretty, pretty good prayer. And uh, after I got done, he said, yeah, my hearing is uh, next Wednesday. Just so you don't, some of you don't come up to me afterwards. No, that didn't really happen. In, in Psalm 73, Psalm 73, verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, this psalm is so wonderful. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on the earth. My flesh and my heart may fail. Well, that's a fact. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, all those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. For me... The goodness of God, mm. the nearness of God is my good. That is where life is, that's where it works, that's where everything fits together. You know, I, I, I really love this song uh, that we've been singing uh, most recently, this lyric here, you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. I mean, that is the truth. He is a good, good father. Don't we love singing the song? He is a good father. And, and I am loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. My identity, our identity, is in the fact that this good, good father loves us. That's our identity. That is what makes us significant. It is indeed the greatest relationship that anyone could ever care to have in life is to have this relationship with the creator of the heavens and the earth to understand his love for you and to share that love back with him. It is the greatest relationship of all. It is without a doubt the highest achievement and I say that putting brackets around achievement. It's the highest achievement. It's an achievement to be loved by God. Not so much to love God, but to be loved by God is the highest achievement. And it's an achievement that you have nothing to do with. His love for you came from His own heart. It's about Him. He decided to love you. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God chose you. God loves you. It is the greatest achievement in life. We all aspire to greatness. Well, I don't know if we all do, but many of us aspire to greatness. All of us aspire to accomplish something soon, you know, in life. Some of us is just to get out of bed and take a shower, but others of us have greater aspirations in life. We want to be a success at this, a success at that. We want to be, you know, accomplish this, accomplish that. I'm telling you, the greatest accomplishment, the greatest achievement in your life is as simple as this, being loved by God. You know, the defining quality for Dan, without a doubt, is that Erica loves him. I mean, he walks around, I'm Erica's husband. <laughs> I, 
Well, uh, somewhat we do that in a love relationship with another human being. We, we feel good about ourselves that somebody else loves us and makes us feel a little bit important and so on. The most significant relationship that you could have is that Almighty God loves you. God wants you. He cares about you. You are valuable to Him. You are in the mind of God. It says that your name is written on the palms of His hands. They're ever before tattooed on the palms of His hands. You thought tattoos just started lately. He's got you in his mind, in his heart. He cares about you. Is there any other greater thing that you could accomplish in life than to be loved by God? I mean, God loves us. How great is that? It is the noblest, the noblest position in life also. Look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Romans, Romans 1, chapters 1 through 3 are chapters that kind of put perspective to humanity. Uh, they put perspective to the frailty and the sinfulness of humanity. Now, the first three chapters of the book of Romans, they really don't bring a smile to your face because it, it, it's like, Man, man is in bad shape. And he starts, he summarizes it. It seems like I, I go to this section of scripture a lot because it means so much to me to understand humanity. This is what God says of humanity. In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, talking about humanity, talking about people, humans, all humans. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become useless. There is none. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. And then it goes on to describe this incredible um, description of each human being. This is the way people are apart from God. So the fact of the matter is, you're born like this. You're born dead in trespasses and sin. You're born separated from God. And, it, and you do not have the ability within yourself to love God. You're not the initiator of this love relationship with God. He's the initiator. You didn't have the ability to do it. You know, it would be like asking a one-year-old to, 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 you know, to drive a car. You just don't have the ability to do it. We did not have, we were not born with the ability within ourselves to initiate a love relationship with God. He had to initiate it with us. That's my point. He's the, the look at the Gospel of John. He is the one that initiates all of this wonderful relationship that is now ours. In John chapter 6. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father, Jesus speaking, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. No one comes to Jesus unless the Father draws him. God draws him first. I will raise him up on the last day. Up here on the chart, it says in, Deut in Jeremiah 31, 3, Yahweh appeared to him to be from afar, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. God draws us with loving kindness. It's the loving kindness of God that draws us. It says in Hosea chapter 11, Verse 4, I led them with cords of a man and with the bonds of love. I've led them with the cords of a man and with the bonds of love and became to them as one who lifts the yoke from their jaws and I bent down and fed them. You know, have you ever seen, or maybe, maybe you've done this, um, I often see it in airports where there, there's a, the mommy has a... Uh, uh, a thing tied to the harness of a little kid, you know, uh, a rope. 
like a leash, right? I, that's always what I think about, you know, the kid's running and the, and the mommy's got a leash on the kid. It's kind of a, um, it's hard not to think of that not being right, but you know, it is right. They, the, 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 and the, the, the kid is being held in by the parent <laughs> so that the kid doesn't run away. Because kids will run away, right? I mean, the, the, you've got to hold on to them. Actually, it's a pretty dang good idea. I could have used five of those. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's what I think of here. I, I led them with the cords of a man. It's like God pulled us to him. He, he, he kind of lassoed us and pulled us in to him. But he led us with the cords of a man. It might mean something different than that. With the bonds of love. And I became to them as one who lifts the yoke from their jaws. Like the, the yoke again of an animal. I've lifted that yoke from them and called them to me. I've brought them into me. That's what God has done for those of us who have received this great love. He draws us to himself. We don't initiate it. He initiated the love relationship. Now again, I don't, I don't pretend to understand why God, and I, I don't want to be self about self here, but I, I, I want to tell you my thought process through the course of my life. I don't, I don't understand, and I never have understood, why God would love me. It has never made sense to me. I've never understood why he would draw me, especially considering what I was doing when he first drew me, the kind of person I was, as Romans chapter 3 described, that I, and, I, and I, I actually, that was a, a pleasant resume for me, the life that I lived, and yet God drew me to himself. I don't understand why he did that. I don't understand why the cords of God have pulled me closer to him. I don't know why he would initiate a love relationship with, him, with me. I don't understand why. But there's one thing for sure, I'm not going to turn it down. I'm not going to reject it. I'm not going to say that it's not so. I know God loves me. And in understanding that about myself, all of that I am not, all that I am weak in, all of my sinfulness, all of everything else just diminishes in insignificance because God loves me. I find who I am in that love. My identity in life is in the fact that God loves me. The fulfillment of my life is in the fact that God loves me. It's not in accomplishments in this world. They are fleeting. I mean, so, you know, you feel good about getting something done, but it goes away very quickly. You know, it, it's... it's uh, the, the real fulfillment in life is accepting the fact and the reality that you are loved by God. That is your identity. That is your everything. Not that you don't have aspirations to accomplish other things in life. That's not what I'm talking about. Sure you do. But really, you can accomplish all the great things you want in the world. If you don't understand that God loves you, you ain't got nothing. You're still wanting. That void... That peace within one's soul that comes with acceptance of that love. Look at Luke chapter 10. When you respond to his invitation, when you responded to his invitation, he brought you into a love relationship with him. You would never have known that love or been in the, pre in the presence of that love, or experienced that love, if God had not first reached out to you. You cannot know God's activity in your life unless He takes the initiative to reveal it to you. You're, for that matter, you can't understand God, or the things of God, or spiritual life, unless God opens up your mind to have it to be so. That's the only way it works. It's all about God. Everything of significance in your life is initiated by God. If you understand God, if you are able to walk with God, it's because God enables you to do so. In Luke chapter 10, verse 22, it says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. 
It's as the Son reveals the Father to us that we understand the Father. They're initiating it, not you. In the Gospel of John, chapter 15, you're in Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 15. Luke, John, Acts, Rome, Luke 15, 16, 15, 16. John, I'm lost. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Again, that's, it's true with the disciples that he was speaking to at that time, and it's true to you and I today. You didn't choose him, he chose you, and then you responded to his choosing you. you it's not out independent of your free will. It's not a Calvinistic predetermined thing that some believe and some don't. That's not what we're talking about. It's bigger than our minds to understand why God loves us. I don't, like I said, I don't know why God would call me, why God would love me, but I know that he does. And I have to reciprocate to that by exercising my free will. You know, John, John 3, 16, for God so, as Bill mentioned last week, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Deuteronomy uh, 30, up here on the chart, Moreover, the Lord your God, Yahweh your God, will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God, Yahweh your God, with all your heart and with all your soul, so that you may live. I, I think I probably need to explain what that means a little bit. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. That's an odd terminology, isn't it? it, it, what it, what it if you know, you know what physical circumcision is, and, and what this is talking about is circumcising your heart. It's cutting away that which screws your heart up. It's cutting away the evil and the sinfulness and the ungodliness of your life. The Lord God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your children to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Any of us who have a sober realization of, of the relationship that we have with God, we also marvel that He could pull us up out of the mire he could pull us up out of the, the quicksand, out of the mud, and wash us off and clean us and make us presentable. How did that happen? How did your life change? He did that. He circumcised your heart. He cut away all of the other stupid stuff of life that impeded you in enjoying this relationship of love with Him. It's all about Him. He loved you first. He called you. He drew you to Him. He enabled you to live with Him. He changed you. He did all of this. Now again, you had to respond. I'm not denying the fact that you've got to exercise free will. But the work, the load, is up to God. For me, it's a decision, and then I just do what He tells me to do. And then He changes us to be the way that He wants us to be. Does that all make sense? One final thought I'd like to put before you is that as you experience God, well, no, let me say it this way. Ex experience with Yahweh is prim primarily, is the primary way to develop your love relationship with Him. When we seek Yahweh to provide for us, and He does, that experience deepens our love relationship. Learning about God through the scriptures is extremely vital to understanding God rightly. Reading the Bible. When we obey His commands, then and only then do we experience Him and gain a deeper love relationship with Him. We know God more intimately as He reveals Himself to us through our experience. Working together with another person is how you grow in a deeper relationship with that person. So is it with God. As you work together with God, you grow in that relationship with Him. In Exodus chapter 3, 
is the record of Moses. Sean, didn't you teach on Moses, uh, Exodus 3? Or did, did you a couple of weeks back? No? Did you teach on it? Well, dang, somebody should. <laughs> hey, I will. Uh, in Exodus chapter 3, Moses sees the burning bush. You're all familiar, right? Moses sees the burning bush. The bush talks to Moses. And, and uh, Moses, at first, he, it takes him a little bit of time to get oriented to what's going on here. But it's pretty obvious through this first chapter with Moses' encounter with God that Moses doesn't know God very well. It's, you know, that God has to introduce himself. He doesn't, Moses says to him, what's your name? You want me to go to, you want me to go to Pharaoh? You want me to go to Israel? You want me to tell Pharaoh to let the, the Israelites go? You want me to tell the Israelites to follow me? When they ask me who you are, who do I tell them sent me? He didn't even know God's name, which God then revealed to him is Yahweh, the eternal one, the existing one. So he didn't even know who he was. His relationship with him was, wasn't all that good. At the end of Deuteronomy, at the end of Exodus, after these 40 years in the wilderness, it says of Moses that he knew God face to face. As a man knows his friend, so God, Moses knew Yahweh. His relationship with God grew and flourished. Why? Because he experienced God for that remaining portion of his life. For 40 years, those 40 years in the wilderness, he experienced Yahweh. There was nobody talking him out of whether or not God existed. Every time we experience God, it helps us to grow in our relationship with God. I love when God answers my prayers. I really do. I love when I see God at work in the world and I join him in that work and then he works through me to accomplish his purposes. I, I just, I love that. Not so much because something was accomplished, but because God worked with me. And it, it just, again, reassured me that he loves me. Every time I, you know, every time that I get this reassurance that God loves me, it's like a, a boost. <laughs> uh, Sean and I had a visit from uh, somebody this past week that uh, prior, to, he, he's been listening to uh, uh, the internet, which is a good thing to do. We have all these teachings on the internet, and Sean has these, these uh, what do you call them, web, webcasts? A podcast. Podcasts. He's been listening to those. He's been listening to our Sunday service. So he was just really wired. I mean, he comes into the office, and he's, he's just, he, he grabbed Sean before he got me, and he's just going on and on. Is he here? Who's going to be here today? If I'm going to talk about the guy, I better watch what I say, right? Because he might be here, and he might listen to it. And then <laughs> he probably will tonight. So uh, he was all excited with John. And he was all excited with me. He talked to me for like an hour. I mean, just the things of God were just all on fire. And he also drank three of those five-hour energy things before he, because <laughs> he works nights and he wanted to be awake. So he was rushing. Well, that's that. That those five. I've never had one. But the five-hour energy drink, is, it's, that's kind of the boost that one gets when the realization is, God loves me. When you, when you practice the principles of God and you see it come to pass, then you know that God is real, you know that God loves you. And there's nothing greater than that. I mean, it's greater than even what you accomplished by the prayer and by you know, God working through you. I mean, oh, wow, I got this done, but whoa, God worked with me. God loves me. God cares about me. There's just, there's no greater boost that you can get in life. You know, people, that comes from applying the scripture in your life. That's what Bill so wonderfully communicated it to us last week. You know, Bill did such a good job last week, they stuck him in the children's fellowship this week. <laughs> we'll see if he's smiling after that. Uh, anyhow, uh, <laughs> Bill pointed out to us from 1 John that if you love God, you're supposed to love your fellow man. When you start loving other people, that is showing God that you love him. And in doing what he says to do, when we love each other, when we care about each other, when we, when we manifest that love to one another, then we start seeing really how much God loves us. He enables us to love each other in such a fashion. 
So my point is that the more you do the Word of God, the more you experience the Word of God, as it says in James chapter 1, you know, not to be just hearers of the Word, but to be doers, as you do the Word of God, you'll experience God in a much deeper, more meaningful relationship with you. And, and I guess I'd like to end by saying to you, if you're ordering your steps in God's way, if you want to do what God wants you to do, you guys can come on up, Jacob. If you're, if you're doing what God wants you to do, don't forget that really the most important thing to God, the most important thing with the big picture, what it's all about, is God loving you. And if it's all about God loving you, then it should be all about our loving Him. And if we're all about loving Him, then we have to love each other. And, you know, the, it, love is the main thing. It's the main thing. Being loved by God, loving God, loving your fellow man. So we got a good, good father. So let's all stand.